From the Chronicle Podcast System, this is the November 29, 2021 episode of SLP. SLP stands for Sheer Listening Pleasure, featuring your host, Neil Shear. In each episode, Neil offers his opinions and comments, speaks with his guests about dermatology, and, sometimes, the topic has been known to switch to one or two other passions. Support for the SLP podcast is provided by Leo Pharma Canada. Neil's guest today is Dr. Shafiq Kaudry. He is a family physician in Toronto, author of several books, and formerly a nationally distributed newspaper columnist. Dr. Kaudry is also the moderator of the Skin Spectrum Summit series of conferences on ethnodermatology. If you have a question for Neil or his guest, or want to be in touch at any time, just send an email to slp at chronicle.org. And, you might even attach a voice clip to your message. If you do, we may use your question on an upcoming episode. And now, here's your host, the Derm Boss himself, Neil Shear. Welcome to the Shear Podcast today, and I am very excited. We have our guest speaker is Dr. Shafiq Kadri, who is a physician, a family practitioner in the GTA around Toronto, uh, but also has a very interesting background in all of this personal development that led to all kinds of things from policy to politics and right back to patients and caring. Welcome to the podcast, Shafiq. And as you know, the reason I really wanted to speak to you was, you know, we're talking to a lot of dermatologists or other people who are involved in dermatology from patient side, et cetera. But here you are, this brilliant family physician who was very early involved with the Skin Spectrum Summit. Can you explain what that means and why it meant so much to you? Sure. Well, lots of things to share with you. At the outset, uh, thank you for your kind words, uh, the type of introduction only a mother could authorize. I also uh, thank you for being one of my clinical professor teachers once upon a time way back in the pre-digital age of 1988 at Sunnybrook Hospital down the street from where I live. So a belated thank you for the uh, excellent Durham clinics. I think to start with, I would really have to Uh, give my hats off to the Chronicle group of companies, as you know, ably led by Mitch Shannon and Alan Ryan and all their various support teams, because they're really the ones who twigged me to this whole aspect of ethnodermatology, a word that I love to say and drop in conversation, by the way, and the whole Skin Spectrum Summit. And really, I mean, without getting too political, in the same way that in some areas, Black Lives Matter, well, skin of color matters. You know, and given the fact, for example, at University of Toronto, and I'm not sure if it's really changed, I doubt it somehow, the amount of Durham teaching is probably not proportional to the how important dermatology and the skin is. You know how dermatologists always like to say, well, hey man, it's the largest organ of the body, which of course always gets a double take from everyone, but it it really is important. It's the first thing that people see, it's the first thing uh, kind of you know connected with self-esteem and your presentation of yourself. And it's really massively important. So it's really to broaden the horizons of appreciation for our patients and hopefully eventually to develop better outcomes for everyone. And what does skin spectrum, that sort of term mean to you? And and what is it like even in your practice and what you see? Sure. As you know, the physicians have various ways of itemizing skin tone, skin color, And just as you can see, uh, for example, the Fitzpatrick is the kind of official dermatology guide to skin tones from white from, I guess, whatever country you could think of, all the way down to, for example, African-American and, of course, all the skin tones in between. And what we're learning and appreciating is that the very basic teaching that we got from dermatology, which says, for example, that, all right inflammation is red. Well, it might be. And of course, we can layer that with fancier dermatology words like erythematous and and so on. But at the end of the day, the skin tone appreciated by the human eye, by the physician, is different depending upon what color the patient skin actually is. And a finer appreciation of that is, uh, I think, warranted uh, as we become a more diverse and multicultural society certainly in Canada, but in many other locations. So in your involvement, and you were involved as a moderator in the recent program, a wonderful job, 
and thank you for doing that. So when you're doing that, what have you learned or see that has been different over the years now that we've had this program? You know, is it doing what it's supposed to do? Are we getting the message out? Is there more we can do? How can we help the patients? Some physicians are guided by their patients. So for example, if you are located in a kind of heavily ethnic area, you might be uh, inspired to go and learn about it. We have other folks who attend quite regularly. I guess they like to attend CME conferences in person and virtual. We have a very, I would say, devoted group of nurse practitioners. And I think a credit to both uh, Mitch and Alan at the Chronicle Group, there's a kind of enlarging group of students. And in fact, this year, what was particularly striking, we heard from McGill University students in the Durham program and even at the undergrad level who have actually undertaken, as they call it, a full anti-racist review of the entire curriculum. And the young medical student that we spoke with actually basically analyzed all the dermatology photographs in their textbooks and came up with a you know kind of statistical actual correlation that, well, there's probably 85% basically, uh, you know, kind of Anglo white skin only for most conditions. And what was also very striking, she said, when they're dealing with sort of, let's call it, you know, negative issues, for example, the skin manifestations of sexually transmitted diseases, there's actually an over representation of other groups. So it was very striking. So, you, you know, you kind of wonder, well, where did that come from? Or how did that come from those sort of decisions? But ultimately, it's really to just say, that you know, there's stranger things in the world than we really kind of account for in our undergrad level. And you live and learn as time goes by. That's a really great summary. And I think there are things that are sort of, if you're in the business, they're not surprising, but it's sort of shining a light. You look at it and you think, yeah, that's true. That is an issue. We do see that. That is wrong. And, um, and, and we're starting to address it. And, and it isn't just the practitioners, again, having a you know, a more, more diversity, but that's certainly a big part of it. And the patients and recognizing their needs, and especially for doctors in practice, it is challenging enough. And there's so many skin diseases that it does make it even harder. So in the current environment, there was a recent paper in one of the American journals about the attitude of having the virtual first. You won't see a patient until you've seen them virtually first. And, you know, should that be the automatic rule all the time. I spent a year and a half doing virtual stuff before I was doing telehealth, but virtual, actually it had its advantages. It was nicer for the patients or if they were there with their 80 year old father who is on dialysis to not have to come from Brampton to downtown Toronto was a huge blessing. But you know, how do you feel about the virtual approach now, given what you were saying about the importance of the skin of color spectrum? I think from a family physician point of view, of course, we have to mix and match. COVID obviously reoriented everyone's framework. And whether it was teleconsultations or virtual health, we now seem to be mixing and matching in our practices, even now that we've you know, tripled vaccinated and now that we're actually physically back in practice. But some patients prefer the virtual. I still get requests for virtual consults. I try actually not to do too much virtual now because, uh, as you will know, the various payers and I guess the Ontario Medical Association and the powers that be say, you know, enough of this virtual stuff, let's get back to seeing patients. But having said that, dermatology, you know, whether we're looking at with a light or a dermoscope or a flashlight, and as you will know, one of our colleagues, Dr. Jaggi Rao from Alberta, actually is leading a whole kind of whole software development where they're doing not only virtual consults, but kind of asynchronous virtual consults, which means basically they'll have, as they call it, a dermatology champion, whether it's a nurse or a family practitioner, or even just a kind of, I guess, a concerned volunteer, where they will actually film a patient on their own time, upload the high resolution images, maybe give a kind of basic cursory history, and then Jaggi Rao Incorporated and company sit there and like radiologists, review the various videos and images at their leisure, and then send directives either for follow-up or prescriptions or further testing and so on. So dermatology, I think in particular, because it is literally, you know, unless you're doing a cancer biopsy, a visual practice, a kind of a visual discipline, 
lends itself particularly to virtual Zoom high resolution, you know, get those webcams going. That is the future happening now. And I agree with you completely. The idea that artificial intelligence is going to be able to do it, Google tried to do this, it doesn't work. First of all, they might be just looking at the wrong lesion. But secondly, there may be other factors. It's way more complex than people think. And I think what you're saying about what Jaggi's doing, it makes a lot of sense because, you know, you start to see a more holistic patient in front of you, if you will, even though they're, they're not there. And, and the patients like it. There's been so many frustrating emails, and I'm sure you see them, where somebody says, well, one recently was somebody who's, whose daughter's got bad acne and is, is basically suicidal. You know, how do I see somebody? How can I get to see someone? And they're just running around there. It's the, the anxiety with it is, is tripled because of that. I respect what you say and agree with it, but I would just add that artificial intelligence, it's one of those, you know, be careful what you ask for. I just give you an example. I was reading an article, I think it was in the New York Times. They did a book review. It was a book written by Kissinger and uh, one of the founders of Google, Eric Schmidt. And half the book review was written by artificial intelligence. And frankly speaking, it was actually more elegant than the human writer. And because, you know, it's more holistic. And I think the, the artificial intelligence kind of consulted like within like a day, 300,000 or 300 million or whatever it was, articles globally and pieced together the kind of word craft. And probably the stage is coming where the artificial intelligence will be able to literally read, probably displace many aspects of medicine, dermatology, family medicine. I mean, I'm sure you've heard about how those I think it was an experiment at MIT at once where the patients were for psychology, psychiatric consults, you know, how do you feel? How do you feel about how you feel? And it just kind of went on like that. It was literally a bot or an artificial intelligence machine or whatever that was doing the consultation. I mean, once you kind of feed the first 400,000 questions that are possible that have ever been asked in the, you know, the history of psychiatry, the artificial intelligence picks it up. It's just like deep blue doing the chess moves. I mean, the time will come where, you know, probably you might even not even be able to see the difference. Interesting times. And yeah, that's a very good summary of it. I just, the photograph stuff has become not quite what people had hoped in terms of ease and quality. So, you know, we'll see what happens, but I think it's, it's a mix. And as you said, there are going to be different needs in different areas and different groups of patients. I did want to tell you because, you know, we were talking about the skin spectrum and the groups that got together and congratulations again to the Chronicle group, because we got these groups together and they were looking at various issues, including getting better books to address the question about what's in our textbooks now and how can we provide these. But one of the other goals was looking at having a chair in ethnodermatology at the University of Toronto. And I will tell you, I just heard yesterday We just heard this, that it looks like the university is agreeing to let that go forward. And they're going to be working over the next few years in terms of raising funds, et cetera, and then ultimately uh, hire somebody to be the uh, first chair of the uh, ethnodermatology, if you will, chair, you know, to have an official chair. I would recommend Dr. Neil Shear for that. (laughs) I'll I'll, I'll be triple retired by then. But uh, thank you. That's very kind. You know what? No, there are really good people who've made careers. uh, And many people I've supported over the years just say, look, this is an opportunity. And it's in our education. It's in who we hire. It's in who we teach. But it is so nice to see for the university to actually recognize one, dermatology as being important. And two, saying, you know what? This is something that can happen. And Vincent Piquet, who's the current uh, head of dermatology at the university, uh, kudos to him for, for getting this through. It requires just a lot of persistence. Sure. I think it's part of the larger move towards cultural competence and incorporation of diversity within the practice. You know, like, for example, I call this my uh, asparagus hypothesis. When you're advising various patients from various cultures, for example, South Asia, to, you know, eat more asparagus and related vegetables and legumes and whatever, when you're doing like a cardiac consult, you know, they look at you like you're mad because there's no such thing as asparagus in various diets. And of course, you can broaden that, you know, to the N plus one level. It's just there's a certain level of competence. And so, for example, 
you have South Asian patients say, do you exercise? Oh, yes, doctor. I exercise every day, 30 minutes. So what do you do? Deep breathing and yoga. And, you know, the, you have to explain, well, when the doctor's talking about cardiac exercise, we don't mean deep breathing and appreciating the Godhead. We're talking about, you know, get out there, sweat a little bit, get that heart pumping, do some walking, get a treadmill, get an elliptical, don't use it as furniture or hanger, and so on. So there's a whole level of cultural competence that I guess if we're going to address the patient's needs on the ground, we really need to be aware of. You know, it makes me think of the communication strategies with patients, and, and especially being in an academic center, we would get a lot of referrals of people who'd seen 10, 12 people already. And I don't know why they would ever think that the 13th visit is going to be different than the first 12, but they did. And it was always interesting to me about what the communication challenges were. Uh, some were people wanted way too much information. Other ones, people want information they say, but can't handle information. Other ones just needed to have a way to engage that was not confrontational. And that is something that requires a little bit of a change in the way we do it. I used to do it with a pen and paper. I would write things on the pad and they would read it and I would read it and we would talk about it. That way we weren't looking at each other. You know, there's so many things. And then when you get the breakthrough and the child gets better or, or the patient gets better, whoever it is, it's the greatest feeling. You know, I don't know how it's going to manage. When you talk about the future, and I've heard futurists give talks which are very helpful because they talk about the kinds of things, AI, et cetera. AI may be better at it than we are, and we just need to do it. But you know, I'm sure you deal with these communication issues all the time. Absolutely. It just reminds me, for example, I had a couple who came from the basically the Middle East, and the lady had various issues, not only for skin, but also gynecological. And I said to her, I said to them, both of them, I said, actually, you have a yeast problem as in fungus, as in Y-E-A-S-T, as you will be aware. He thought I said you have an East problem, as in Middle East, and he got quite offended. And there was kind of this like non-proportional conversation for about a minute till I realized he thought I was insulting his cultural origin, or I was actually talking about some bugs. And you know, we had to kind of like deconstruct that. In terms of future, well, we were, whether we're looking at future AI or the future knowledge base of our students and perhaps physicians in general, and as always, God bless U.S. advertising, which, as you know, probably drives at least 15% of the Canadian consultations in all domains, because patients will come and say, oh, I heard somebody say this, or I want that vaccine, because, uh, you know, the Shingrix vaccine, for example, because like any pharma company, they kind of go through these cyclical advertising targeting campaigns. So between all of that, I mean, we have, you know, a multicultural vice president of the United States, although they seem to be doing their best to hide her these days. But at some point, you know, all that, uh, all that will come forward. And, uh, you know, she was president for 85 minutes the other day and whatever. It was the quietest 85 minutes in the past, in the past six years. Yeah, I'm sure they made sure there were no key decisions to be made. Yes. She's a winner. I mean, I thank you. I was like, thank you for that, those uh, 85 minutes. So do you see, what do you see for the future of, of skin spectrum? I mean, is it just the education? Or? First of all, I think we'll have more and more attendees, more and more disciplines, so not only family physicians, and by the way, quite a number of dermatologists who I think want to brush up or learn, uh, add to their scope of practice, and whether it's the students and others. Obviously, uh, with regard to the formats, both live and Zoom and pre-recorded, there's newsletters that folks can sign up for that they can get on a, I think, weekly basis to keep in touch. But I think the future bodes well just for adding, as I said earlier, to the diverse appreciation of not only our clientele, but also their skin and all the different conditions that we have to wrestle with. And I remember chatting with one of my uh, friends, not a physician. And, you know, explaining to her, well, what does uh, depression mean in psychiatry? Well, you're, you know, blunted affect and anhedonic and lack of pleasure. And she eventually sort of looked at me and said, so do you mean like they're sad? And I go, uh, yeah, they're sad, you know, and dermatologists kind of like that. They can't just say it's like red or purple or it's bumpy. You know, we have very fancy ways of saying all that stuff to the point you really have to deconstruct it. You know, it's like a violaceous with imperfect borders and papular and macular and so on. And those are bread and butter words to dermatologists. But for example, patients will come back, maybe they've had a biopsy 
they don't understand the biopsy result and you have to like do a whole real-time translation so all of these things whether we're translating known medical information into human being speak or and especially if there's a cultural kind of angle to it or, and even a cultural translation i mean all of these things really i think look good for us in terms of not only a multicultural city like toronto but leadership from skin spectrum cinema and folks like yourself i want to ask you one other thing about the care process and and so if you're seeing a patient you know you sound pretty comfortable with seeing the dermatology and trying to you know deal with it but what if it's something that you're really a blistering disease or something and you say you know what are you able now in the current situation are you okay in getting you know people to see a specialist oh of course like anything it's basically on a case to case basis one of the things that's interesting though is if you refer for example a patient with a particular condition to a dermatologist if the dermatologist makes the tactical error of writing you an excellent consult note and you actually read it and imbibe it you kind of figure out what's going to happen and what needs to be done so you may eliminate potential referrals that way but of course if a patient so for example if we have a lesion that we think it requires a biopsy or or by the way maybe our first line or even second line therapy is just not working or as you know family physicians are now kind of learning that by the way it's not just tablets that you swallow there are also biologics that can be offered to patients even things like chronic or to carry a you know there's biologics available as you know so and that of course will generally require kind of an infusion site hospital visit a specialist consult specialist blessing and so on so again it's it's really tailor made to the patient and by the way some patients will demand it up front they're not interested in relying on the family doctor they want to go straight to the dermatologist they'll even bring the name of you know here's a dermatologist and he's a at U of T or he's a professor or he just won some award or or you know he got uh, some award from whatever charity it was and he, I met him at some dinner or gala and uh, I want to go see him now and here's his card <laughs> yes yes the practice sounds pretty much the same and i just wonder it'll be funny to hear this conversation 10 years from now and think yeah you know really is uh, changed a bit but not that much the artificial intelligence is also people are using their many technologies investigating getting away from skin biopsies and not just using ultrasound which is one way but using all kinds of you know reflective and other techniques where you can actually but they're still evaluating them but i can see that changing too and i i think you're right that you know our practices are are going to change fundamentally it is interesting seeing the people are interested in going into medicine now and talking to them and they're so passionate about it and so passionate about the future uh, i certainly think back you know but what attracted me to dermatology and, and the science at the time was lousy there was nothing there were maybe one or two things that were made up and yet i always felt it had great scientific potential and now it seems to be uh really happening in in a big way a lot of drugs like you mentioned new ones like biologics are being studied in skin even first before they go on to other areas and then go beyond that it's a complicated world now but you seem to be handling it do you have any advice about you know in terms of the turmoil and all the new stuff coming up you know do you think the programs that the college of family physicians puts out i mean are there things that you feel you're able to really keep up in a meaningful way cuz the reading you could pick one journal and, and never catch up on anything sure well i think we need to fire on all cylinders especially in this information age to maintain not just competence but even just awareness of all the developments so whether it's the various uh, regulatory bodies or the college or maintenance of competence whether it's industry which i i look to because they literally at the end of the day they have the funding and the resources and they've got all the kind of specialists and as KOLs key opinion leaders on board anyway so uh, they're often i think probably the good source for uh, leadership uh, you know whether they're endowing a center or funding research or helping to get the word out in terms of for example third party organizations or even advertising in the various media the only thing i would just add is that another overlay to the future developments not only of dermatology disease but probably just disease in general is the whole genetics revolution which to my mind is still to happen they announced a human genome project in early 2000 and oh we're going to read the entire human genome and it's not fantastic i'm still kind of waiting for that really to take off but having said that probably with computing power growing exponentially as it is even exceeding uh, moore's law the kind of doubling of processing power you know we're not going into quantum computing probably they'll be able to figure out 
even as you know, things like 23andMe point you to basic higher risk for alcoholism or, or uh, Alzheimer's or whatever, based on your kind of rough genetics. But probably the stage is coming where they'll be able to really predict to a much higher degree of accuracy, even diseases like derm, whether it's, you know, melanoma and so on. And I think when we marry that with the visuals, and then of course, by the way, the other thing, even the visuals, whether we're doing it on Zoom or elsewhere, it's pretty well a two-dimensional approach. I mean, I don't know too much about Zuckerberg's metaverse, but I can imagine where the derm consult or any consult is now going to be, you know, we've got us our Oculus Quest, Oculus Rift, 3D glasses, and so we're telling the patient, turn around, and we're kind of doing like a holographic photograph, and as you said, maybe uh, inflicting upon the patient some kind of reflective analysis with some high-level camera, where we really, and then it's, you know, loaded up to the cloud to some AI thing mixed with our own impression. I'm sure that's all coming over time. You know, there's probably going to be a whole dermaverse coming through along with the whole Facebook thing. I was thinking of things to say, but I think dermaverse did it for me. Uh, that's a great ending. Yeah, the dermaverse, that's, that's a good thing to think about. Yeah, I really like that. And I'll be happy to mention that it's your idea. But the Dermiverse, absolutely. There's a lot of things going on that go in the genetic stuff. I'll just mention that that's a big part of what I do in terms of drug safety. And, you know, we have in North America and in Europe have not done as well as, you know, areas in Southeast Asia, et cetera, in terms of screening people before you put them on a drug and seeing whether they're the ones who might be at the highest risk of getting some sort of bad skin reaction or something like that. So there's a lot to do in that area. And there are suggestions, if you will, in the product monographs that you could do skin testing or genetic testing, and you should, but what does that mean? Should doesn't mean anything. And if you must do it, it's a different story. So there's a lot of work to do that, but you're right, we'll be putting all these pieces together in this puzzle and the patients will be active participants in a different way, but certainly not as passive as they had been probably when we were in early training as partners. So the Dermaverse, okay, we'll finish on the Dermaverse. Thank you so much. And I appreciate your comments about the Skin Spectrum group and what Chronicle has put together and all the things that they're bringing together are just fantastic. And it's really nice to see people who are so media savvy sharing that contact and expertise with us. Is there anything else you'd like to mention before we uh, sign off? No, I just say onwards and upwards. And thanks to uh, the Skin Spectrum folks and for really increasing the knowledge base of physicians and the public alike. Merci beaucoup, mon ami, à la prochaine fois. Thank you so much, Shafi. You take care. Be well. If you'd like to learn more about ethnodermatology and upcoming learning opportunities, visit www.skinspectrum.ca. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and colleagues. On our next episode, Neil will chat with another guest from the world of dermatology. To subscribe to this series, go to www.derm.city or find the SLP podcast at Apple iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you look for podcasts. Support for the SLP podcast was provided by Leo Pharma Canada. Send your comments to slp at chronicle.org. Until next time, be well.